faction have opposed each other over his handling of a case involving the extradition of a Roman Catholic priest accused of child molestation. The disagreement grew this week after the Prime Minister announced that the Attorney General in charge of the case would be promoted to President of the High Court. I now call on Tisha to move the motion. Tisha. Thank you, Ken Corlea. And I might as well put it on the record at all that I was only responding to the wishes expressed here today that I go and get the fullest amount of information before I come into the House. Uh, I have to say that uh, since I rose here about an hour ago, that uh, I haven't since uh, found any further evidence of in response to the queries raised here. Uh, I suppose, like other places, I too am getting, getting phone calls and saying, would you check this and check that? And I suppose that's only to be expected in those sort of circumstances. But if any member of the House has any genuine information, and I don't mean wild allegations, because Deputy Rabbit did say that what he was speaking about would rock the foundations of this state. That's a very, very serious statement to make. And I think there, there, it, it's incumbent on all of us to produce any evidence we have. And as I say again, I will not shirk my responsibility in trying to find out information for this House and for the general public. Not a bit. I made a statement in this House yesterday regarding the circumstances of the appointment of Mr. Harry Wheeler under the presidency of the High Court. I also referred yesterday to my total commitment to public accountability and on that basis I make this further statement to the House. Not down yet. Please now. I just want to ask the teacher because they're going to have second. Have in a few minutes. Let's, let's have an orderly debate now. Members will have an opportunity of intervening at the appropriate time. If he would tell us, is he going to circulate a speech? Of course, yes. Thank you. I'm sorry it's not done. I explained fully the circumstances of the case, and I answered all questions fully and honestly on the basis of information then available to me. In nominating the former Attorney General to this high judicial office, I was honouring the precedents which had been established by successive governments since the foundation of this state. In honouring this commitment, I was dealing with Mr. Harry Wheelahan on the same basis as I had dealt with people all my life in business and in politics. That is, my word is my bond. Having made that commitment on the basis of long-standing precedence, I felt duty-bound to honour it. The decision was made by the government on the assumption that the legal, vice, the legal advice from the then Chief Law Officer of the State was the full detailed information available, both in law and in fact, and was based on the fullest inquiries being made as I had initially directed. When I appointed the new Attorney General, Mr. Fitzsimons, the Minister for Justice on my behalf requested him to conduct a full and detailed investigation of the file in the Smith case and to report back. The investigation carried out has produced the information that the Smith case was not the first which fell to be considered under these provisions of the 1987 Act. At all times and in his report to the government of last week, the former Attorney General stated that the Smith case was the first to be applied under the same provisions. This was given as one of the reasons for the delay in processing the case. The investigation of the new Attorney General, Mr. Fitzsimons, has shown that in a 1992 extradition case, namely Duggan, executed by the former Attorney General, Mr. Whelahan, the Section 50 provisions were considered. At all times, my colleagues and I in government were told by Mr. Whelahan, in whom we placed our total trust, that the Smith case was the first in which those provisions of the 1987 Act had to be addressed for the first time. I would have expected that the most senior legal officer of the state would have known of the Duggan case of 1992, considering that he himself cleared the worms for endorsement by the Garda Commissioner and would have made this information known to me and the government. This information 
was not made known to me and the government by the former Attorney General. Had my colleagues and I been aware of these facts last week, we would not have proposed or supported the nomination of Harry Whelan as President of the High Court. I, if you want facts and truth, that's what you get. I am informed that the former Attorney General had forgotten about the Duggan case when he prepared and approved the report sent to me. I am informed that the official in the Attorney General's office who was involved in the preparation of that report was similarly not conscious of the existence of the case when the report was prepared. In fact, the official who had dealt with the Duggan case did not remember it when requested to assist in the Attorney General's investigation. This file was turned up. This file was turned up. This file was turned up by another official who, in the course of the investigation, was putting together details of other extradition cases. However, I would also have to say that, in my view, the report was seriously misleading to the House on this issue. If the report if the former Attorney General was still in office, he would have responsibility as Attorney General for this report. His responsibility would be particularly grave, as he personally had cleared the warrants in the Duggan case, and his signature is on the relevant submission. If the former Attorney General was still the holder of that office, he would, in my view, in the circumstances, have had no option but to resign. He would be honourably accepting responsibility for the fact that his report did not disclose the fact that there had been a previous case in which the same question of law was considered and which has been dealt with by him personally. Because it was not made known to us, and having considered all the circumstances and the concerns and questions raised, and following explanation of the concerns of the Labour Party, I want to clear up a number of matters. Had the full information been available to us, our decision would have been different. I now accept that the reservations voiced by the Tarnister are well founded, and I regret the appointment of the former Attorney General as President of the High Court. I also, I also if this House wants to do its duty, they should listen to the facts. I also regret my decision to proceed with the appointment against the expressed opposition of the Labour Party. I guarantee that this breach of trust, a trust on which the partnership government was founded, will not be repeated. I had hoped, I had hoped, I had hoped that these assurances would form the basis of an agreement, and I still hope that this is the case. Another issue has also arisen. The Attorney General, in the course of an exposition on various aspects of the case, referred to in my presence on Monday to the existence of a previous case prior to the Smith case, the Duggan case, as we have already spoken about, which had involved the consideration of the lapse of time and of the same provision that arose in the Smith case under the 1965 Extradition Act, inserted by the 87 Act, by way of amendment by Deputy Sean Barrett, and left some technical legal papers with my private secretary on the matter. I was not supplied with speaking material to insert that into my speech, referring to this particular point. When I returned to my office after last night's debate, there was a letter waiting for me from the Attorney General, emphasising the importance and significance of this case, and I have now had a proper opportunity to consider its full implications, which I have now given to the House. I have indeed the letter that I received yesterday evening, was, uh, came during the, the debate here in the House, and I wish I can call it to put this letter and its full contents on the record of the House. 15th of November 1994, on Taoiseach Mr Albert Drennan's TD. Dear Taoiseach, the Minister for Justice requested me to prepare a reply to a question as follows. Was this the first time that this section was applied? I have done this and it is enclosed herewith. The reply is the best that I can do. 
It does not, in fact, answer the question. The contents of the second paragraph is the case that is effectively made by a senior legal assistant who dealt with the case. The reference to the fact that a number of the offences dated from as far back as 1964 is correct. However, you should be aware of the fact that these offences are alleged to have been committed on a date unknown between the 10th of March 1964 and the 12th of March 1971. Okay, we'll get a point. All right. I'm expected to respond I'm immediately to this. Because I think uh, immediately the Taoiseach sits down. Yeah, okay, we get you. Uh, you know. We get you. Accordingly, it would not be accurate to say that they actually occurred in 1964. The more recent offences occurred between the 1st of December 1982 and the 3rd of December 1988. If one takes the latter of these dates, it can be seen that the lapse of time between their commission and the date of issue of the warrants was just over four years. In my view, no serious issue of delay could possibly have been raised under this section in respect of these offences. In addition, I would say that it is my view that having regard to the nature of the offences and extradition, defence based on delay would unlikely to have been successful in respect of the earlier offences. Having said that, however, I would concede that a legal issue arose in respect of the similar offences in that uh, lapse of time involved was very considerable indeed. The Smith case is not the first time that the section was considered. It was considered in the Duggan case, though without any deep legal study or any research into the issue, of delay being carried out. The facts of the Duggan case, however, in my view, made such further research unnecessary. The delay involved was some four to six years. The Attorney General took the correct decision, in my view, in sending the accused back on this occasion. The problem about the Duggan case in the overall context arises from the fact that the delay in that case was from four to six years. As stated above, some of the offences in the Smith case were alleged to have been committed over a period ending in 1988. In my view, it would be absolutely incorrect to inform the Dáil that this was the first time that this section was considered. It was considered, though not in a profound manner, in the Duggan case. It was also, in my view, be similarly incorrect to say that this was the first time that the section was applied. It was not, of course, applied in this case in the strict sense of the term. It would be for the court to do that. Alternatively, if the Attorney General had made a decision not to extradite Father Smith, then arguably this could be viewed as an application of that section. Yours sincerely, Owen Fitzsimons, Senior Counsel. In the Duggan case, the person concerned was extradited. I want to mention this specifically and I hope that by reading that letter into the records of this House, and I will be supplying a letter to everybody, that there will be some appreciation of the complexities involved. Some appreciation because that's why I needed, while I was given uh, initial information on Monday, Monday afternoon I think, I asked for the full detail because I was not in a position to give that full detail here yesterday. When I left here and went back to my office, that's what I found. I, went, I got time to assimilate it, got time to look at it, and then recalled the Attorney General to indeed explain the whole implications of it. And that's why I bring the whole facts into this House so that people will understand that that is the full fact as I have it. I can understand the perplexity on Deputy Bruton's face because it'll give you some idea of the length of time I had to spend to try and look at what was there. When I return, as I said, last night's debate... Order. Let's hear I on nothing yes. Without interruption. And I say nothing. Because if anybody would expect... I got that letter on my desk and yesterday afternoon... I 
a tear on this T-shirt record of the without House interruption. Speaker, to the best of my ability, I am stating unequivocally that delivered to my office. Please, look, I think it's a very serious and important issue. I think it is. And that's why you should understand it. I have now had a proper opportunity to consider the full implications which I have now given to this House. The Minister for Justice will be making a personal statement in relation to this, to this matter during the course of her contribution to the debate, in which she will deal with all the relevant aspects of this matter in detail. I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, and I repeat now, that we must all work to restore the spirit of partnership which is the cornerstone of this successful government. I solemnly commit myself as Taoiseach and leader of Fianna Fáil to restore that spirit of partnership and trust. This has been one of the most successful and hard-working governments of recent times. Despite the difficulties of recent days, it has been the first genuine partnership government in this state. It has broken new political ground bringing together two parties, Fianna Fáil and Labour, that have proved very compatible from the policy point of view. We negotiated the most ambitious and impressive programme for government that has ever been implemented. I am proud to have led this government for two years in a fruitful partnership with the Dick Spring and his colleagues. They have made a tremendous contribution to all that we have achieved together. We have had major successes on several key fronts. We have made the biggest breakthrough towards peace in Northern Ireland in 25 years. We restored economic confidence after the currency crisis and are now enjoying a high level of economic growth. We have negotiated an £18 billion national development plan with the European Union over five years, which is the biggest investment plan in the history of the state. We have renewed and extended social partnership with a third program for competitiveness and work since 1987. We have streamlined all procedures to make them more meaningful and the government more accountable. And we have brought in many enlightened social reforms. It would have been a tragedy if this work had been interrupted with the program only half completed and peace in the north not yet properly consolidated. There is every reason for this partnership to continue until its task is complete. In all major policy areas, good progress is being made, and the two parties in government have been working together well and harmoniously. Most responsible opinion at home and abroad wish this administration to continue. There were surprisingly strong editorials to this effect in both the London Independent and the London Times yesterday. The Belfast, Telegraph, the Belfast Telegraph, which is a moderate unionist newspaper, has written that a down, has written, Let's hear on Taoiseach without Belfast interruption. The Telegraph, which is a moderate unionist newspaper, has written should assist in interrupting. that a downfall of this government at this juncture would be disastrous. This has been by far the most accountable government in the history of the state. Thanks chiefly to the efforts of the Chief Whip, Noel Dempsey, we have instituted a regular fixed period for Taoiseach's question time. We have set up a more powerful committee system. We have improved the facilities and backup available to legislators. We have improved arrangements for raising topical questions. We have introduced an ethics in government bill which requires the disclosure of interests as well as legislation to regulate the political fundraising and electoral expenditure of political parties. I know of no precedent for the level of openness and accountability that I have provided as Taoiseach. I was the first to disclose all my private business in this House and I don't know of anybody that has followed suit. I have appeared... I have... Let's let the interruption I have, cease. I was the first to disclose all my private business interests. 
I have appeared on countless radio and television programs in Ireland, in Britain and America and elsewhere to explain and promote the cease process and to sell Ireland as a good location for investment. And I know you begrudge me every minute. Listen. Have a bit of respect. Listen. I must insist that every member participating in this debate shall get a good hearing. This partnership government... I will hear no point of order. I will hear no point of order. I consider this to be an unwarranted interruption. On is in possession. Deputy will resume his seat. This partnership... Deputy, resume, look, resume your seat. Deputy Shatter, doubtless Deputy Shatter will participate in this debate. In the meantime, he should restrain himself. This partnership government have created a thriving economy with the best prospects for years. We rapidly restored confidence after the currency crisis. Interest rates came tumbling down to their lowest level in decades. We faced prospects of strong economic growth of around 5% or more for several years ahead. Some experts are inclined to cast doubt on the reality of the figures. As International Credit Rating Agency, IBCA, has put it in recent weeks, and I quote, taken over long periods, the official growth figures will probably overstate things a little, but not by a wide margin. They are unlikely to alter the essential picture of an economy which is catching up with its richer brethren and which is the fastest growing economy in the European Union. The flow of revenue from increased economic activity and the increase in the net numbers of employment currently running at 20 to 30,000 a year cannot be denied and are confirmation of strong economic growth. Unemployment is currently some 30,000 below its peak when the government took over office in January of 1993. Virtually every other economic indicator is strongly positive. Inflation is running at slightly over 2%. We have a record balance of trade and balance of payments surplus. Government borrowing is well under the Maastricht guidelines and the debt GDP ratio is steadily falling. Inward investment is booming, as is tourism. We have been able to steadily reduce taxation. It is not for nothing that we were, along with Luxembourg, the only member state to escape censure at a recent ECOFIN meeting. Our debt rating has been upgraded. The conjunction of strong, balanced economic growth, social partnership, strong European inflows and the peace dividend present us with the best economic opportunity in years. We have a partnership government determined to make the most of this and to achieve a real and lasting breakthrough on both employment and prosperity. The change in the government at this point would be a serious check to economic confidence. This government have made substantial progress in implementing the programme for government which is committed to enacting a wide range of legislation. In 1993, 43 bills were enacted. Already this year, 27 bills have been enacted with a further 18 bills currently before the Dáil and Shannon, and a comprehensive programme planned for the remainder of this session. We have introduced and are in the process of introducing much enlightened social legislation. Constructing a lasting and durable peace will be a long and difficult and a challenging undertaking. Nevertheless, the cessation of violence by both sets of paramilitaries in the wake of the Joint Peace Declaration last December represents a major breakthrough which has created great hope and renewed confidence, especially in the north of Ireland. It has removed much of the fear and enables people to start leading normal lives without fear of being caught by a bomb or a bullet. The shooting dead of a post office worker in Newry last Thursday was a totally unnecessary human tragedy and an aberration. It raised question marks which needed to be clarified. I do not believe from the reactions to date that the definitive political commitment to the success of the democratic peace process on the part of Northern Ireland Republicans is in any way diminished. I am glad that it has been made quite clear 
that the cessation of violence includes all forms of armed action. But the event underlines some of the real problems on which the government were always conscious, facing the consolidation of peace. Nevertheless, there is a widespread determination to remain on track for the removal of the gun from Irish politics for good. There is overwhelming public support for peace, north and south. The deep-rooted tragedy of the last 25 years, which cost well over 3,000 lives and left thousands more maimed or bereaved, have gone on for far too long. The killing from whatever side was pointless and futile and advanced no political cause. The greatest credit belongs to those in both communities, like the SDLP and Alliance, as well as church and community leaders who recognised that position clearly from the beginning. But we must also recognise that it required considerable personal and political courage on the part of the Republican and Loyalist leaders to persuade their respective paramilitary organisations to draw a line under the campaigns of violence and to opt for a purely political future. While we legitimately expect steady progress towards demilitarisation on all sides, we must try and avoid unrealistic or premature demands which may only serve to undermine or delay the achievement of true peace. Whether we like it or not, we have to encourage responsible leadership within the communities from which the paramilitary organisations spring. My government have shown responsibility in our handling of the peace process. Without relentless determination on our part, without the closest unity of purpose between the Taunish and myself, there would have been no Downing Street declaration, no IRA ceasefire, and no confidence in the stability or durability of the cessation of violence in the ten weeks since. Let us look at what has been achieved so far in the first 10 weeks since the first ceasefire. We've established the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation and brought Sinn Féin fully into the democratic process. Their leader has publicly recognised at the meeting with John Hume and myself that a lasting political settlement cannot be achieved without unionist agreement. Around 100 severed border crossings are in the process of being restored. There has been some relaxation of security <coughs> in a way that benefits people going about their daily lives. All broadcasting restrictions have been removed in both islands. Freedom to travel has been granted to both Republican and Loyalist leaders with the lifting of exclusion orders and the granting of visas. Significant additional international aid from the European Union, the United States and Australia and New Zealand have been obtained, mainly through the channel of the International Fund for Ireland. An initial boost has already been given to trade, investment and tourism, especially in Northern Ireland. We have begun in this jurisdiction a review of prison sentences, but we were not able to proceed for the moment with a limited programme and of early releases, while the implications and consequences of the Newry shooting are being carefully considered. The Tanishte has also made further progress with the framework document which will form the basis of political negotiations. I would not accept that we have moved too fast or too precipitately in anything we have done. A dilatory or an indecisive wait and see approach on our part would have rightly attracted criticism for its lack of imagination. We needed to underline the value and immediate benefits of peace. The framework document, because it remains confidential until it is agreed, inevitably arouse, arouses fears of the unknown, especially with the unionist community. There are, these are perhaps influenced by memories of the Anglo-Irish Agreement. The framework document, in a, except insofar as it relates to matters that are clearly for the two governments, is a basis for future negotiations. There is no agreement in it on north-south institutions that will be imposed on the northern parties without their consent. The main principles of self-determination, balanced by consent, are at the core of the peace process. I would like to point out to the unionist community that our approach to them has been entirely different from previous Irish governments. Not only have we made it repeatedly clear that the Irish government will not be a party to any coercion of them. 
But also, unlike the time of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, we have sought at the time of the joint declaration was being negotiated to establish lines of communication both with the mainstream unionist leadership and with the loyalist organisations. These lines remain open. Their input is reflected in the very substantial passages addressed to unionists in the Downing Street Declaration, the Statement of Rights which was forwarded to us from the loyalist organisations and incorporated in paragraph 5 without significant alteration, and the paragraphs on building trust and reconciliation between the two traditions on this island. Secondly, I never expressed any hostility to a devolved government in the north. Indeed, I recognise it is probably an essential part of any peace settlement. Obviously, it has to be re-established on an agreed basis, which is recognised on all sides, will include responsibility sharing. It has to fit in with the other essential elements of an agreed settlement. We've made it clear from a very early stage that we are not seeking the imposition by diktat of joint authority by the two governments over Northern Ireland. All we want is a democratic partnership with the Union's community and the nationalist community in Northern Ireland, not any form of domination over them. I do believe that if there is to be an agreed political settlement, it will need to include a substantial north-south dimension. We will be looking for agreement on north-south bodies with the executive powers for two reasons. The first reason is an entirely practical and pragmatic one. The latest Northern Ireland Economic Council report, number 111, states, and I quote, the peripherality, or perhaps more, the isolation of Northern Ireland is compounded by the comparative lack of integration with the Republic of Ireland. It identifies the comparative lack of integration of manufacturing or of important industries such as food processing as an example of weakness. There is a very clear case for integrating the promotion abroad of key economic sectors such as tourism and inward investment. It is quite true that at the moment we are competitors, but it is also true that the South fares much better than the North at present on both counts. My belief is that both North and South would benefit but particularly the North, from combining our efforts and sharing out the promotion and the benefits equitably and measuring our success by reference to the island as a whole. Such an approach requires courage and commitment on both sides and a willingness to override vested interests. It will be not just business but the unemployed on both sides of the border that will benefit. There are, of course, many other areas, such as inland waterways, aspects of agriculture and the environment and transport which will also benefit from a joint approach. It goes without saying that the political representatives of Northern Ireland, unionists as well as nationalists, as well as those in the authority in the south, will have to oversee any such cooperation that will, be, that will need to be fully democratically accountable. There are many in both communities in the north that see the logic for many purposes of a single island economy or indeed a single market within the single market of the European Union. Such an approach will also solve the desire of the nationalist community in particular for institutional recognition of their Irish identity. Partnership within Northern Ireland must also extend to all sets of external relationships. Implicit in the Downing Street Declaration and reflected in the framework document will be the clear desire of both governments to remove any implicit threat of coercion. The British government have declared that they have no selfish, strategic or economic interest in Northern Ireland and will not stand in the way of anything that the people of Ireland, North and South, may freely self-determine. Indeed, they will encourage any measure of agreement that can be reached. Equally, the Irish government agree that it would be wrong to attempt to impose a united Ireland without the agreement and consent of a majority of the people of Northern Ireland. A balanced constitutional accommodation will reflect those realities on both sides. But we must be careful that in any changes that we make that, incorporate, that incorporates the principle of consent and that remove any implied undemocratic right of coercion, we continue to uphold the birthright to membership of the Irish nation of everyone born on this island or of Irish parentage that is so precious in particular to Northern Nationalists. Many difficulties and problems lie ahead. 
the solution lies, at least in part, in building on and consolidating confidence in peace. Any reminders of paramilitary violence and the threat that it poses must be removed. Real progress can only be made on the outstanding issues of prisoners, policing and disarmament on all sides, and indeed on the political and constitutional aspects of a new settlement if the peace is, remain, is maintained unbroken. I believe both communities are fully committed to the peace process and are excited by its potential opportunities. The Irish Government will continue to promote peace as the top of our priorities with the cooperation of the British Government. The pace of movement will be dictated above all else by the full maintenance of peace on the ground. If and when there are setbacks, and apart from last week they are, they have been, there have been virtually none, we must take any action that is appropriate and then try to move forward again. We must ensure that the new era of opportunity is not allowed to fade. Both the Tarnished and myself are fully committed to that. My colleagues will deal with all the other matters relating to the very fine record of this government during this debate. This partnership is by far the best government available. It fully deserves the confidence of this House. And earlier today, there, there was, it seems, a basis for agreement between the two parties. I would still hope that that agreement can be brought to a finality and that the, 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 issue, the issue that caused it to be set aside for the moment will indeed become clear after this House clearly sees that I have produced all the records of what I have in relation to the Attorney General's office. I am well aware of the many other stories that are fluctuating around here and as I said earlier that when I get any further information, I am prepared to come in, interrupt the debate, and let you know, uh, let you know, let you know exactly if any further information is available. I've just been handed a note to say that one more of the AG staff has now been contacted. He has no knowledge. He has. He has no knowledge of of representations. And could I finally appeal to those deputies who are making these accusations? Um, not, not Deputy Kelly. The Leadership is about to Deputy conclude Kelly. his remarks. Not Let him do so without constant interruption, Deputy Allen. If they have any, if they can Deputy any Allen, time, I have asked you to desist. Be of assistance to all of us to try and get to the root of these unfounded rumours at the moment, and that's all I can describe them as. But as I say, I hope that the issue that uh, has divided agreement between the two parties can be seen in a light. But I come into this House, but I give you all the facts that I have, that's, that I can find in relation to the Smith case, the Duggan case, or any other case that has been, that has been, that has been my position. I am not covering for anybody. I have no intention of covering for anybody. I treat everybody on the same basis on which I find them. And if there's any more information that I can find or that any deputy in this House or Senator can give to me to indeed allay the fears and the justifiable fears that's arising in this community about the rise of that offence of child abuse. None of us would defend it, and I think there's a responsibility in all of us to clear up all the rumours that's around, if indeed this House can supply us with information. I'd be only too glad to investigate and to come into this House with a full story, not part of it, and, on, and only in relation to when I have a full, evaluated, factual position given to, given to me by my legal advisers. Thank you. John Broughton. has just engaged in a merciless destruction of the reputations of other people in, order, in a desperate attempt to save his own skin. 
He has effectively said that Mr. Harry Whelan is not only not fit ever to have been Attorney General, but is most certainly not fit to be, pre be President of the High Court. And he says that even though he is the man that insisted last Friday on appointing him. He says, and I think it is probably the most amazing statement in his speech. He says that if Mr. Whelan was still Attorney General, in view of the discovery of the facts in regard to the Duggan case that were not disclosed by Mr. Whelan at the time, that if the former Attorney General was still the holder of that office, he would, and I quote from the Taoiseach, in view of the circumstances, have had no option but to resign. I ask the question, why will the man who insisted on appointing Mr. Whelehan as President of the High Court not resign too? If the Taoiseach have had any honour or dignity, he would have come into this House and announced his resignation. Instead, he chose to do something which I believe is constitutionally extremely dangerous. He chose to besmirch the reputation of a judge, somebody who cannot be removed from office other than by impeachment, who is to serve for life. The Taoiseach has besmirched his reputation in order, in a vain attempt, to save his own. That, I believe, that eventuality, what has happened in the last hour, I believe has done appalling damage to the relationship between the legislature and the judiciary. I have no idea what the consequences of it are going to be, but I know that they are most serious. The Taoiseach said yesterday, and I quote, that he was giving a full account of what happened in regard to the Father Brendan Smith case. Yet, he admitted today that the present Attorney General had the previous day, Monday, in the course of exposition of various aspects of the case, referred in the Taoiseach's presence to the existence of a previous case prior to the Smith case, the Duggan case, which had involved consideration of the lapse of time and the same provision that arose in, arose in the Smith case under the 1965 Extradition Act. In other words, the Taoiseach told the House today that he already knew on Monday that the explanations that were furnished by the Attorney General to the effect that this was the first such case were simply not true. He knew when he rose in this House that what he was saying here yesterday was not a full explanation. And yet he went ahead. Now he's trying to blame his private secretary for not having drawn this matter adequately to it, his attention. Left some technical legal papers with my private secretary in this matter. The implication is that his private secretary is not doing his job. It would appear to me that the Taoiseach, as I have said, is literally setting out to destroy everyone else so that he may save himself. Now, it is the case also that it is not only the Taoiseach 
who is involved in this issue. There is another minister who significantly got up to leave the House immediately I rose to speak. And that's the Minister for Justice. The Minister for Justice also stated here in this House on the 25th of October in column 520 that she understood that, and I quote, this case was the first in which provisions had arisen for consideration by the Attorney General's office since the enactment of the 1987 Act. The Taoiseach has now destroyed the Minister for Justice's reputation by revealing that that statement was not true. He has brought into the public attention now at last, under pressure, the existence of the Duggan case. Now we all know that the warrants in all of these cases, both the Smith and the Duggan cases, are furnished both to the Department of Justice and to the Attorney General's office. Therefore, the Minister for Justice must have known about the Duggan case just as she knew about the Smith case, because the warrants for both were furnished to her department. Therefore, she had at least the means of knowing that the statement that she made on the 25th of October to the effect that this was the first case of its kind was not and could not have been true. Now the Taoiseach, safe in the knowledge that he doesn't have to do anything about it because Mr. Harry Whelan is now beyond his power, has said that if Mr. Whelan was still in office, Mr. Whelan would have to resign. Well, the Minister for Justice is a member of his government. I ask him, is she going to resign? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because she should. But there's one reputation, there is one resignation that should precede the resignation of the Minister for Justice, and that is the resignation as Taoiseach of Deputy Albert Reynolds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said in this House, in the Beef Tribunal debate, having studied in great detail the way in which the Taoiseach did his business as set out in that report. The way in which he made decisions involving millions of pounds at private meetings where there was no official present. The way in which he gave some people large amounts of export credit and denied it to others for no apparent objective reason. The way in which he connived in the law being broken in regard to the breach of the authority of the Industrial Development Authority. I said then that I believed that Mr. Deputy, Al that Deputy Albert Reynolds was not fit for high office. I hope that some other members of the House who voted confidence in Mr. Reynolds on that occasion, who didn't agree with me that Deputy Reynolds was unfit for office, will at least at the end of this debate come to the same conclusion that I came to then. I recognize that it is easier for me to have said that than it is for some of those who must make the decision now. I am the leader of the opposition. Some of those who must make the decision now are members of a government. And it is not easy for them to give up their offices. And I've no doubt they are convinced that they are doing good work. But I think the road, the ending of the road, has undoubtedly been reached tonight. I believe it should have been reached on the Beef Tribunal. I deplore the fact that on the Beef Tribunal debate, both the Fianna Fáil and Labour parties refused to allow the Taoiseach to be subjected to the sort of questioning on that issue that he was, questioning, that he was subjected to here last night on this issue. Both Labour and Fianna Fáil went through the lobbies to vote against 
any intensive questioning of the Taoiseach on that issue. They voted to allow him to make a general single speech justifying him himself and avoiding most of the questions and leave the House. Now I have no doubt whatever that if the Labour Party had allowed the Taoiseach and had agreed to the Fine Gael motion to be subjected to the same questioning on the beef tribunal issues that he was subjected to yesterday, that they would have come to the same conclusion then that I expect they will come to tonight, that he was not fit for office. Because there is no doubt in my mind that everything that was set out in the beef tribunal debate and its contents shows that this man should not be Taoiseach. I regret also that the same process in regard to questioning the Taoiseach in an open-ended way was not agreed to by the coalition parties in regard to the issue of passports for sale. I appreciate that the Tanishta took the trouble to examine the files. And I have no doubt about his truthfulness in saying that he found nothing wrong there. But if the Tanishta had studied the Beef Tribunal report as closely as I have done, he would see that the manner in which the Taoiseach is, does business is one which leaves no trace on paper. The business is done orally. It is done on the phone. It is done by the nod and the wink and the understanding. It is not done in a way that will leave any trace on a file. And while I accept that the Taunishter was right to look at the file himself, I think we were all wrong in not insisting that that whole issue was not examined by a committee of this House, where the Taoiseach, the ministers involved and the civil servants involved would have been subjected to the same type of sustained questioning that the Taoiseach was subjected to yesterday. I have no doubt that if that had happened, that the Labour Party would also, on the passports for sale issue, have come to the conclusion that the Taoiseach was not fit for office either. They would have come to the same conclusion that I expect they will come to tonight in regard to what we have heard tonight. This event that we are now contemplating is not one of which there was no warning. Indeed, we were warned of this most eloquently, more eloquently than I perhaps am able to summon my words together on this occasion by the Tanishta himself. The Tanishta himself said on the 5th of November 1992 about Albert Reynolds. This is the Taoiseach who talks about consensus, but who governs behind closed doors. I think we've had an example of that. In this case, the door was closed and the Labour Party were on the outside. Deputy Spring also said on that occasion about Deputy Albert Reynolds, this is the Taoiseach who says over and over again, that the buck stops with him, but who makes every effort he can to ensure that the buck lands in the, in, the, in the lap of the civil servants who work for him on behalf of the state. That's the end of a quotation from 1992 from the Tanishta. The Tanishta had no reason to be surprised about what has happened. I don't understand why the Tanishta chose to make Deputy Albert Reynolds Taoiseach after that 
but that's another day's work. However, it's fair to say that the characteristics that we're talking about here are the characteristics of a whole party and not just of one person. Again, I may quote from the Tonishton in the same speech in November 1992. He said, I believe one political party in this house has gone so far down the road of blindness to standards and of blindness to the people they are supposed to represent that it is impossible to see how anyone could support them in the future without seeing them first undergo the most radical transformation. Now I think it's fair to ask the Tanish and the Labour Party if they believe that that radical transformation has taken place. I believe it hasn't. And what's more, I believe it never will. And I believe that anybody who is asking for the support for the Irish from the, of, of the Irish people in an election has an obligation to say where they stand on that issue. Do they believe Fianna Fáil is an acceptable partner in government for them or not? That's the question that people will want an answer to. And there will be no avoiding that answer. There will be no words that can be used this time that will prevent that answer being given, however reluctantly. My party, after the next election, whenever it comes, will have nothing to do with Fianna Fáil. And I want to know the position of other parties in this House on that matter. If they're not willing to give that answer here in this House, in light of what we have seen about the way in which the Minister for Justice and the Taoiseach have done their job here today, about the manner in which the Beef Tribunal was issued, issue was handled by the previous leader of Fianna Fáil, by the present Taoiseach, and by other ministers of the Fianna Fáil party, about the way in which the passports issue was handled by the Minister for the Environment and other ministers. If members of this House are unable to come to a view about whether Fianna Fáil has been adequately transformed by now, and give a clear answer to that question, then one can only assume that they are willing to go back into government with Fianna Fáil after any election that may take place. This time, there will be no dodging that question. It will have to be answered. I believe that Fianna Fáil has proven itself to be incapable of governing in coalition. This is not something that has occurred in the past six days. It is part of the ethos of Fianna Fáil that has manifested itself time and again since 1987 and before. I now want to refer to another important matter. I believe that this debate will be followed later, probably rather than sooner, but inevitably by a change of government. <coughs> and it is a legitimate matter for those in this House and those in this country to know where the next government of this state will stand. Firstly, on the peace process. I have devoted my political life to reconciliation. I believe that politics is reconciliation. It is the art of reconciliation in practice. 
It is bringing people together. My party is proud to have been the party that negotiated the Sunningdale Agreement with the Unionists as well as the SDLP. And the Taoiseach taught, sought, to say, sought to say, and the Labour Party, I'm sorry, that was a genuine omission, if I may. <laughs> Toddy, you believe? My, <laughs> the Labour Party and Fine Gael negotiated the Sunningdale Agreement, okay, right. Uh, we negotiated the Sunningdale Agreement with the Unionists. And the Taoiseach saw it in this speech here today to suggest that his was the first government to have treated the Unionists on that sort of basis. That simply isn't historically true. Equally, our party in government with the Labour Party made every effort to involve the Unionists in the process leading up to the negotiation of the Anglo-Irish Agreement as well. We have always sought an inclusive approach to this issue. Furthermore, as far as the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation is concerned, we intend to make that work. We intend to make it work for peace and reconciliation. We intend to use the Forum as an opportunity of consulting other parties in this House, whether they be in government or in opposition, about the issues that face us from time to time. We intend to make it a means for ensuring stability and continuity in pursuing the peace process. I simply wish to conclude by saying that we need a new government. And we need a new government, firstly, to advance the peace process on the basis of stability and genuine partnership and trust. We need a new government that will have the ability to tackle the problem of unemployment at its roots, to reform the tax system and the social welfare system to ensure that they support in every way possible the creation of employment. We need a new government to ensure that our nation's resources, natural, physical and human, are managed in a sustainable way and we, that we do not have a lifestyle that cannot survive into and beyond the next century. We need a new government that will reform the institutions of this state to make everybody in this House who holds office truly accountable. We need reform to ensure that when questions are answered in this House, if the answers are not adequate, that the Count Corda can demand that a further answer be given. Only by that change will it be possible for us to ensure that the government of the day is truly accountable. And finally, we need a new government which will devolve power in our society, remove the centralization of power in the hands of a small group of people in Merrion Street, a concentration of power which is the breeding ground for allegations of corruption, which is the breeding ground for suspicion and the breeding ground for alienation by people who are not part of the charmed circle. We need a radically reformed state and I hope that the result of this vote will be to lead us to have a government that will achieve that. Uh, Oh, I beg your pardon, Tony Stan. Yeah. <laughs> Tony Stan, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Deputy Dick Thank Spring. Thank you, Count Corla. I haven't tried that experiment just yet. He <laughs> <laughs> promised us a copy of the letter that he read out. We haven't got it yet. That will come in due course, Deputy. On Tony Stan. Check, check, check your post box. Count Corla, I assume that uh, Deputy Bruton's assertion 
that he won't go into government with Fianna Fáil can be taken with, as the same validity, with the same validity and imprinted in granite like his uh, refusal to go into government with the Democratic Left in 1992. That seems to have changed. Alan? Order, still, please. In, still in the house, Alan? Still in the house? Look who's behind you, John. John Corla, it is entirely appropriate that I should, here in the House, set out my considered response to the events of recent weeks, and particularly to the events here yesterday and indeed since yesterday. This is the correct and appropriate place for those who hold public office and are responsible for decisions of public concern to account for their actions and for their omissions. The key issue throughout this entire episode has been accountability, the right of the public to secure adequate explanations, and the responsibility of the holders of high office to take responsibility for their actions. At the very outset, I have to say that semantic distinctions between responsibility and culpability, however, however interesting they might be in their own right, do not meet the needs of this case. If this House were to accept that a minister would never be accountable to the doll without direct culpability on his or her part, the principle of accountability would wither away. Without accountability, the value of parliamentary democracy would be fatally undermined. And it is no part of my understanding of the principle of accountability that it only exists in the case of decisions already taken. In the particular horrific case of Father Brendan Smith, it was a failure to take necessary and urgent decisions that led to a gross breach of responsibility to the public. Are we really to believe that government or its agents are only accountable in respect of the things they should have done and in respect of the things they have done, and never in respect of the things they should have done. But again, at the outset of anything I have to say, I want to make it clear that I did not come into this House to seek an apology to the Labour Party, or to me, for the political actions of others. Politics is not about bruised egos, and I have no interest in seeking either apology or flattery as a substitute for democratic accountability. If an apology is owed to anyone, it is owed to the victims of this priest and to the parents and family members who have been hurt by his depravity over many years. Let me also address right at the beginning the question what some seem to be asking. What does the Labour Party want? The question is being asked almost as if it, was up to, it were up to us to decide what others should say, or as if we were looking for some kind of reward for standing over the breach of public responsibility involved and the appointment of Mr. Wheelhan to the High Court without accountability. Let me answer the question. What the Labour Party wants is an accounting, a true and fair accounting. Nothing more than that. We were hoping yesterday to hear something that would convince us that it was right to prevent the Attorney General from explaining his actions before publicly promoting him. We were hoping to secure some kind of convincing explanation that the Attorney's apparent attitude that everything about this case was handled reasonably could be reconciled with the actual circumstances of the case or else an acceptance that the attorney's account was plainly wrong and grossly insensitive. We were hoping to hear some sort of admission that a serious error had been made in promoting the attorney to a place where he is immune from questioning despite the strongly held convictions of more than a third of the government and that the people had been let down by a reckless and impetuous act and we heard none of those things. I intend in my contribution to this debate to refer first to the issues arising in the handling of the Smith case in the office of the Attorney General and by the former attorney himself. Second, I intend to deal with the background to the appointment of the attorney as President of the High Court. And third, I intend to set out how I will vote on the motion before the House when that vote is taken. Even became, before I became aware of certain facts that I intend to deal with later, I have to say that with great regret, I found the speech of the Taoiseach yesterday extremely disappointing in its failure to recognise that, that there has to be a higher level of responsibility for the actions of government. In the course of his speech, the Taoiseach correctly refused to excuse the failure of the Attorney General's office for its handling of the Father Brendan Smith case. Unfortunately, the Attorney himself, in his presentation to government, did seek to excuse that failure. In effect, he endorsed the handling of the case on entirely spurious and offensive grounds. Yet, even though the Taoiseach apparently now accepts that this matter was handled insensitively, with lack of appropriate urgency, that the delay was totally unacceptable, and that there were gaps and flaws 
He knew all of that last Friday, when he apparently accepted the attorney's belief that it would be harsh to find fault with the way the case was handled. How else could he have proceeded to appoint Mr. Wilhelm to the second most senior judicial office? One has to ask, if the Taoiseach had made yesterday's speech last Thursday, would he still feel comfortable about standing over the actions of last Friday? Alternatively, and this is, I think, goes to the heart of the difficulty, how is it possible to reconcile the entire detailed account of everything that has happened with the assertion made by the Taoiseach in his speech that the emergence of the Smith case did not affect the Attorney General's suitability for high office? In fact, to an outside observer, it must seem odd that the only difference the Smith case appeared to make was to increase the urgency of making the appointment. Even though the Taoiseach purported to account to the House for the events, he at no point addressed the issue of why it was not possible for the attorney to similarly account. As it is now well known, there is a precedent for such an accounting in the handling of the Father Ryan extradition case. The Taoiseach barely mentioned this precedent and offers no explanation as to why it was not considered appropriate. He went on to say in his speech that he received no warning of our intention to leave the Cabinet room in the event of the appointment being made and regarded our withdrawal as nothing more than an expression of dissent from the decision. That assertion ignores the two letters the Taoiseach received from me, together with the one he sent me on Thursday last. I have circulated copies of those letters with this statement. In the first letter I sent to the Taoiseach, I made it clear that, and I quote, in the circumstances, my colleague, we have come to the, reluctantly to the view that we cannot support the appointment of the Attorney General as President of the High Court unless and until a satisfactory explanation of these troubling events is offered by the Attorney General personally or through you in the Dáil in such a way as to allay the public concern. In replying to that letter, the Taoiseach said, and I quote, in an attempt to meet your concerns, I would propose placing before the government in the morning the Attorney General's detailed explanation of the Brendan Smith case in order to allow any further questions. This is the only appropriate forum in which the AG can be properly questioned. In addition, I intend to propose to, go to government that the AG's explanation be published immediately. In a further letter, I said to the Taoiseach, at the very least, I would expect that you would answer questions in the Doyle in such a way as to allay public concern before final consideration of any appointment being made. <coughs> that correspondence makes it clear beyond any misunderstanding that we could not accept this appointment prior to pu proper public accountability. It is also worth noting that we withdrew from the Cabinet meeting when the Taoiseach terminated discussion on the Attorney's report and called on the Minister for Justice to propose the appointment of the Attorney as President of the High Court. The Taoiseach in his speech said that he understood we were withdrawing only because, and I quote, the government procedures are such that dissenting voices at a government meeting are not record recorded in the government minutes, whereas members of the government absenting themselves may be recorded if they so request. It was for this reason that we took the view that, rather than staying at the table, our Labour colleagues were absenting themselves for this decision only, thereby recording their dissent. In fact, I have to say that while government procedure instructions in an officially protected document, I can ensure the House that it contains nothing whatsoever to this effect. The Taoiseach also seems to imply by this remark that neither I nor my colleagues need take any accountability for the appointment of the attorney since we were not in the room. Such an argument would clearly fly in the face collective responsibility. I made it clear on Sunday last that of course we were collectively responsible for that appointment even though we disagreed fundamentally with it and that we had to do, had to do what we had to do was to decide was whether that was right, the right position to be in. It is further worth noting that if there was any misunderstanding about our intentions, ample opportunity existed to clarify the matter even after we left the cabinet room. Instead of doing so, the teacher acted to ensure that the attorney became president of the High Court by 6 p.m. that day. It would be hard to see, see that as anything other than an attempt to present us with a fait accompli, even though I do understand that the president was not going to be available either on Saturday or Sunday, and I accept that. All of this brings us back to the central question, to which there was no answer in the teacher's speech. Why was it necessary to proceed with the appointment prior to any form of public accountability being available? In moving to the second part of my remarks I wish to make, let me say at the outset that it is true to say that I had, prior to the Brendan Smith affair, come to my own conclusion that in the interest of government cohesion, I would have to set aside my reservations about the qualifications of the Attorney General for this post. 
I never communicated any such view to the Taoiseach, was not prepared to do so until certain reforms on which we had reached broad agreement were fully implemented. However, once I became aware of the Brendan Smith affair, I would not and could not abandon those reservations prior to the exercise of public accountability. It is, however, appropriate that I should say something about the reservations I had. I agreed to the reappointment of the former attorney at the time of the negotiations of the, form of the formation of government. I never had any difficulty working with him and did so on a regular basis, especially, for example, in relation to aspects of the Anglo-Irish negotiations in which I am involved. I have, I think, made it clear that I would, not have, I would not have been at all unhappy to see him promoted to ordinary membership of the High Court at any time that he wished and that a vacancy existed, always assuming, of course, that the issues with which we are dealing now had been properly accounted for. However, I took the view throughout my discussions with the Taoiseach, discussions which I initiated, initiated well before the end of last year, that the two most senior positions in the judiciary required appointments which would reflect very high skills and a substantial vision. I felt throughout, and feel still, that at the very least, an attorney with no judicial experience should, not be, should be prepared to serve an apprenticeship as an ordinary member of the High Court before aspiring to the presidency. It is worth noting, and it is a point of which I think the Taoiseach is well aware, that the former attorney is in fact the first such holder of his office to have been appointed as President of the High Court. The Taoiseach quoted in his speech from, the professor, from Professor Basil Chubb to justify his assertion that by custom the Attorney General is always offered any vacancy to the High Court that arises during his term of office. However, in the course of preparations for the Ethics Bill, my office was supplied with a speaking note prepared for the Taoiseach by the Cabinet Secretary at that time, of the appointment of the, at the time of the appointment of the former Attorney General, in order to assist the Taoiseach in advising the Attorney of his terms and conditions of employment. That speaking note makes it unequivocally clear that, and I quote, appointment as Attorney General does not imply any commitment whatever on the government's part to subsequent appointment to the next or any vacancy on the judicial bench, unquote. In fairness to the Taoiseach, I have to say that when I brought the speaking note to his attention, he told me that he had not used it when appointing the former Attorney General, and I believe that. Of course, the speaking note could not be expressed in any other way. Our Constitution reserves the right of appointment of members of the judiciary to the President of Ireland, acting on the advice of the government. An appointment to the bench cannot be in the gift of any one person or to be seen as a right by any person. Any promise or condition of employment which guaranteed an appointment to, to the judiciary, thereby preempting the free and unfettered decision of the government in the matter, would clearly have to be null and void. Fortunately, and despite impressions to the contrary, no such conditions of employment exist. It would also be true to say that it was not until very late in my discussions with the Taoiseach about judicial appointments, discussions which, as I said, I had initiated in the latter part of last year because of my interest in ensuring that such appointments would receive the maximum consideration, that I was made aware of any promise made by the Taoiseach to the attorney in respect of the presidency of the High Court. In fact, in a number of points in our discussions, we sought and received advice from the attorney about different options and scenarios that we were considering. It was not until very late indeed in the course of those conversations that I was advised that the attorney wanted the office of the president and that the Taoiseach had offered it to him. I have often wondered when the request or offer, whichever it was, was in fact made. Notwithstanding all of that, I, ha all of that, I had, as I have already said, come to the conclusion prior to the Smith scandal that the interests of government cohesion demanded that I set aside my reservations about the appointment. But I cannot stand over an appointment made in the absence of accountability. I will always believe that the attorney himself had an obligation and a duty to answer questions in the public domain prior to any appointment. He chose not to exercise that option and the Taoiseach and the Fianna Fáil members of government, despite my misgivings that any misgivings they might have had, choose to support that refusal. I could not. This brings me to the third part of what I wish to say and that is to explain how I intend to act and vote in this debate. This, I believe, has been a good government as the Taoiseach has said and has said again today. I am proud to stand over its record in many respects. We have done much to develop and strengthen the economy. We have established a record of good and careful management. There are signs every day that the strengthening of the economy is reflected in more jobs and greater confidence. At the same time, we have done much to undo the damage inflicted by previous administrations on essential public services. Those who have been housed or those who found essential health treatments more readily available or who have seen the major improvements in our education system, or who have been part of the new excitement in the world of art, music and film, 
can all testify to this. Those who have benefited from the huge list of reforming legislative measures that has been enacted in the government's short life will, I believe, readily acknowledge that this has been a government that has made a difference. In no other area of the life of our country has the impact of this government been more profound than in relation to Northern Ireland. From the moment we came into office, the Taoiseach and I committed ourselves to make the, mo to make the movement towards peace and reconciliation our first priority. Nobody can deny that the Taoiseach has been unremitting in his determination to bring people in from the margins on this issue and to persuade those who had previously disdained democratic politics to give peace a chance. This strategic approach was the bedrock on which the peace process was built and it is to the Taoiseach's eternal credit that he persevered from beginning to end with a single-minded determination to achieve the laying aside of arms. The peace process is not now as fragile as some commentators would have us believe. The decision of the British government to open preliminary discussions with both Sinn Féin and the political representatives of the loyalist paramilitaries, and to do so in the near future, has given the process added impetus and ensured that there is still room to build. But of course, political instability in the Republic of Ireland is not a desirable basis on which to proceed. I have always believed that our democracy is strong enough to withstand such temporary difficulties, just as I believe there is no leader in this House who would not be willing to carry on the work started by the Taoiseach in the spirit in which he started that work if the necessity arose. That would be nothing less than our bounden duty. Throughout all of this, my own relationship with the Taoiseach has survived a great deal of hard work, carried out together, and indeed a number of disagreements. Whether we are talking about the structural fund negotiations, or the tax amnesty, the handling of the beef tribunal, or the passports affair, or indeed other controversies which attracted less publicity, I do not believe that anyone can argue that these issues were approached by us, or by me or the Taoiseach, in a spirit that threatened the cohesion of the government. And it would never be my wish to do so. I have found the last couple of weeks the most difficult of my political life, and the decisions I've had to make the most painful. Before outlining those decisions, I must outline the events of the last number of hours. Early this morning, I was advised that new information had become available to the Taoiseach and to his ministers. This information consisted in broad terms of the following. And indeed, the Taoiseach has referred to this himself in his earlier address. The new Attorney General had found in his office evidence that, the previous, that a previous case, very similar to the Smith case, had been handled by the office in a totally different manner to the way in which the Smith case had been handled. This other case, which had also arisen during the tenure of the previous Attorney General, had involved an ex-monk. It involved allegations of sexual abuse in another jurisdiction, allegations that related to a period some time ago. And it involved a request for extradition on foot of those allegations. That previous case had been dealt with in an extremely expeditious way. The issues of law had been teased out very quickly, and, matter, and the matter had been placed in front of the Attorney General very quickly, and the warrant had been endorsed by the Attorney General. In other words, the system worked. There was no breakdown, and the normal method of operation had resulted in a quick and expeditious extradition. The issues of law which were referred to as arising for the first time in the Smith case had in fact been dealt with before. In addition to being given these facts, I was also informed that the Taoiseach and the Minister for Justice were now satisfied that they had been seriously misled by the explanations of the attorney in the Smith case and that there were no grounds for believing that the fault in this case lay in the system in operation in the AG's office. I was informed that both the Taoiseach and the Minister for Justice were prepared to come into this House and to lay out all these facts for the information of the House. The Taoiseach on foot of this was prepared to say that that, to the House that he, was now that he now deeply regretted the decision to appoint the former Attorney General and the manner in which it was done, and he now accepted fully that my reservations about this appointment were correct. On foot of these assurances and undertakings, I indicated that I was prepared to support the government in any vote that took place in the House. In my judgment, this would be necessary in order that in order, at the very least, to enable this whole matter to be fully investigated, and decisions to be made about the next steps that needed to be taken in view of the former attorney's misleading explanations about the way in which his office dealt with extradition cases. However, following all these discussions, I decided to speak to the present Attorney General himself about these issues in order to clarify aspects of the case that I have just referred to. 
I asked the attorney if he would inform me when he advised the Taoiseach about these matters. He told me he had done so on Monday, that is to say before the Taoiseach made a statement to the House yesterday. It was, immediately, it was immediately apparent that the Taoiseach should have included this vital information in the statement he made to the House yesterday if he wished to give a full explanation of all these events. Had he done so, I believe it would have completely altered the entire trust of his speech and had a profound effect on the subsequent debate and questioning. To describe the handling of the Smith case as a consequence of a system developed for past conditions, failing to cope with present realities, to assert to the House that he, had, that he had asked tough questions about the system, to say that he regards the attorney's explanation as a record of system failure, and as something showing the gaps, the flaws and the liabilities that had to be tackled. None of this, and a great deal more, is possible to reconcile with the new information available to the Taoiseach, which was not put before the House yesterday. Having made this discovery, I went with some of my colleagues to meet the Taoiseach shortly before noon today. I outlined to the Taoiseach what I had discovered and, I, and the implications of that discovery. Before concluding Kiancorla, on a personal basis, I want to thank my government colleagues for their efforts and their dedicated work in achieving <coughs> our objectives outlined in the programme for government. And I wish each of them well and their families who suffer an awful lot in the business of politics and in public life. I wish them well for the future. For the reasons I have outlined, I believe it will be obvious to the House that neither I nor any of my colleagues can vote confidence in the government at the conclusion of this debate. All of my Labour colleagues in Cabinet and all of the junior ministers who are members of the Labour Party will resign from their offices before this vote is taken. I believe the House is entitled to nothing less from us. The motion is introduced. May I take it the motion with the supplementary estimate is agreed? Agreed? Agreed. agreed. Restatements on the circumstances surrounding the appointment of the President of the High Court. I now call on Tisha to make a statement. On Tisha. Can call you. Over the last 48 hours, there has been much speculation about the kind of statement the Labour Party might want from me on this occasion to ensure the future of the partnership government. <coughs> Ken Corley, this is a good government. And I and my Fianna Fáil government colleagues believe it is our collective responsibility to continue its work. This is a good government and a good partnership even now, halfway through our term, the results prove that. However, in preparing this statement to the House, I have wider and deeper responsibilities. I must today explain the failure of a system in this specific case, a failure with ghastly and specific consequences for the children of this country. I must not excuse the failure. I must ensure that it never, ever happens again. I will give this House a full and detailed report. But a full and detailed report of a failure in our method of dealing with such a crime as child sexual abuse will never and can never be satisfactory. It can't be satisfactory and it isn't satisfactory to me. As a father and a grandfather, I find the idea of paedophilia revolting. That the paedophile would be a priest with a special access to children and the extra layer of trust that we extend to the priesthood, that is much worse. Much, much worse. It is a betrayal of innocence, a betrayal of family, a betrayal of an honoured position and a betrayal of a national commitment to the innocence and vulnerability of young people. I wish to preface my dealing with the explanation furnished by the Attorney General by stating up front my own view of that explanation. It sets out the details of the handling of the case 
in the Attorney General's office. It cannot be satisfactory because it shows a system developed for past conditions failing to cope with present realities. I will not defend the system. On the contrary, I have asked tough questions about it. I am dissatisfied when I see the standard rules and precedents being used but not working properly. I have demanded radical change. I will, as head of government, take responsibility along with all my colleagues for the fact that the system should have been changed sooner. That is my view and the view of my many Fianna Fáil colleagues on the issue of public accountability. We accepted a full explanation of what had happened, not as a justification for what had happened, but as a record of system failure, and as something showing the gaps, the flaws, and the liabilities that has to be tackled under the new Attorney General. The general public have now had the opportunity to read the full text of the explanation in the Irish Times and in the Irish Independent. I intend to place the full text in the Library of the House. It has been stated that the appointment of Mr Whelan to the bench has the effect of preventing me from answering questions in this House in relation to the case. That is not so. I have been advised that the fact that Mr Justice Whelan is no longer Attorney General does not prevent me from dealing now with any matter that arose during his term of office. I can deal with it in the same manner as I could, were he still the Attorney General, even though in formal constitutional terms he is not accountable to this House. <coughs> there was an unacceptable delay in the handling of this particular case for which we must all in government take responsibility. On my own behalf and on behalf of the government, I wish to express my deep regret to the Irish people for the delays that occurred. I give a solemn assurance in this House today that such a situation will never arise again on the part of an organ of state whose special duty it is to look after the rights of the citizen. I want to take this opportunity of confirming categorically to the House that I have been assured by the then Attorney General that he did not know and was not made aware of the existence of a request for the extradition of Father Brendan Smith until recent weeks. The existing procedures gave rise to that obviously unsatisfactory situation. In view of the seriousness of the issues which have arisen in connection with this matter, I decided that there should be a thorough immediate review of the operations of the Office of the Attorney General. I have directed that this review will be completed within the next three weeks, after which I expect a radical reorganization of the Attorney General's office to take place. This review has been carried out by a high-level group chaired by the Secretary, Public Service Management and Development in the Department of Finance and comprising the Secretary to the Government and the Secretary of the Department of Justice. The group is free to seek such assistance from within and outside the civil service as it considers necessary to carry out its task as expeditiously and thoroughly as possible. The terms of reference of the group are to review and make recommendations on the relevant organisational structure, systems, procedures and staffing arrangements in the Office of the Attorney General. I see this review as being the essential first step in the preparation of a statement of strategy for the Office of the Attorney General. A strategy statement will provide the basis 
for the reform of the operations of the office in the longer term and underpin the immediate measures that I have just announced. I have asked the Attorney General to ensure that it is put in place as a matter of priority. Lessons from this case have already been learned by the Attorney General's office. It is now recognised that this case was not handled as sensitively and urgently as it should have been. Steps have been taken to remedy this. New administrative arrangements have been put in place to ensure that the Attorney General is informed of every extradition request immediately it is received by his office. In addition, the Attorney General has directed that henceforth absolute priority, absolute priority over other work, irrespective of its importance or urgency, will be given to any extradition request that involves the abuse of children. I can assure this House that there will never be another Brendan Smith case again. Extradition requests are among the important matters that are invariably placed before the Attorney General himself for his personal decision. But before he will be in a position to make his decision on the request, the preparatory work on the case has to be done by his professional staff. Nevertheless, I believe and I operate on this basis in my own office that important and sensitive matters should be brought to the immediate attention of the Taoiseach, Minister or office holder, such as the Attorney, so that he or she may give directions as to how the matter is to be dealt with within his or her own office. The importance and urgency of this case was clearly not appreciated and understood in the AG's office. Legitimate concern has been expressed by many people at the fact that this case, involving as it did, accusations of sexual abuse of children, took so long to be dealt with by the Attorney General's office. I fully share that concern. I appreciate and regret the deep anxiety which is felt by everybody, especially parents, about this particular case. Two particularly serious issues arise in connection with this case. The first is, how the Attorney General's office could take seven months to process the warrants? And secondly, who is accountable for that situation? In relation to the seven-month delay, with great regret, I have to tell the House, that there is no really satisfactory or adequate explanation which I can give in response to that. One reason that has been advanced by the AG's office has been the issue of Father Brendan Smith's address at the time of the warrants. The address on the warrants was a previous address in Northern Ireland, but on the accompanying documentation supplied only to the AG's office was an address at Kilnacrot Abbey in County Cavan. It was unfortunately assumed in our Attorney General's office on the basis of this, that if Father Brendan Smith was in the state, he was living at that address, living within a religious community. That comfortable assumption, which we now know was regrettably incorrect, resulted in consideration not being given to the possibility that Father Brendan Smith might be out in the community or in contact with young people. There was an unquestioning belief that residents within a religious community by a person accused of offences, such as those specified in the warrants, would render it out of the question that he would engage in, or have the opportunity to engage in, further activities of that type. 
the statement in the documentation as to Brendan Smith's residence upon which that assumption was made should not have been accepted by the AG's office at face value. It is a mistake that cannot be allowed to happen ever again. In future cases of this type, any such statement will have to be thoroughly investigated. I fully accept that there has been justifiable public concern about the manner in which this particular extradition case was handled. Proper priority should have been accorded to it. It was dealt with as a normal extradition case. But this was clearly not appropriate, given the particular seriousness of the offences and the possibility that existed for further offences to be committed. <coughs> I regret very much that the lack of urgent action on it has caused so much anxiety to parents and others. I can assure them that they will have no basis for such anxiety in the future. I fully agree with the criticism which has been made that the process of examining extradition warrants in the Attorney General's office must be changed and changed radically. A seven-month delay in processing the paperwork is totally unacceptable. I conveyed my strong views on the way in which this case was handled. The Attorney General will ensure that all members of the staff of his office are fully aware of these views and of the absolute need to ensure that all matters related to the welfare of children will be accorded the highest priority in future. In the wider context of policy, this partnership government have made childcare a priority and have undertaken that all sections of the Child Care Act will be implemented. Priority will be given to those provisions which confer new and improved powers on health boards, the Gardaí and the courts to intervene more effectively in cases of child abuse. Our state legal services must also reflect these priorities in their work. The general question of responsibility and accountability has been raised in connection with this case. The Attorney General is an independent constitutional officer and is not part of the executive of the state. He is a legal officer of the government, but also has a quasi-judicial role. In the case of the implementation of the Extradition Amendment Act of 1987, the attorney is required to direct that a warrant for the extradition of a person from the state shall not be endorsed unless, having considered such information as he deems appropriate, he is of the opinion that there is a clear intention to prosecute that person founded on the existence of sufficient evidence. The Attorney General is not answerable to the government or to the Dáil for that particular statutory function. As regards the integrity of the Office of Attorney General, I am, am informed that only one officer in the Attorney's Office was involved in the processing of the Smith case. In response to my personal inquiries, I have been assured that there is no question of outside influence being brought to bear in the case. When a request for the extradition of a person has been received from another jurisdiction, the decision whether to advise the Gardaí that they may endorse the warrant, thus initiating the extradition process, or whether to direct them not to do so, is one for the Attorney General himself, and not for any official, save in the case of absence or illness, which is not relevant in this situation. The Attorney General is responsible for the decision whether to grant or refuse an extradition request. In the Smith case, the Attorney General did not make any decision because the preparatory work which had to be done by officials had not been completed 
at the time it became known that Father Brendan Smith was voluntarily going to Belfast to face trial there. As is well known, he did return and was in due course sentenced to four years imprisonment. <coughs> I now wish to deal with a number of specific points. First point was, why was there such an absolute refusal to issue a public statement or face public questions? I am doing today what I clearly indicated last week that I would be doing. I am giving a full account. There has been no refusal to issue a public statement or face public questions. The second point was in relation to, and I quote, the attorney's explanation that he had not seen the request, amplified by the assertion that there would be no point in his seeing it until all the preparatory work had been completed by an official, unquote. This was contrasted with his predecessor's statement in December 1988, that the attorney, and I quote, bears ultimate responsibility for the initiation and conduct of extradition proceedings. The third point was that in his explanation, the attorney also says that what comes to him and what does not is decided on the professional judgment of the person with responsibility for the relevant file, unquote. This is contrasted with a letter from the Attorney General about aspects of the Ethics Bill in which he referred in detail to the non-delegatory nature of the job of the Attorney General. The answer to those two points is as follows. The initiation and conduct of proceedings in the above context refers to the courts, not to the examination of the file in his office. Anything that requires the decision of the Attorney General is of course submitted to him. And his decision-making functions indeed cannot be delegated. But that does not mean he has to work single-handed or in particular that work preparatory to a decision cannot be delegated. I would now like to address some of the broader issues of this case. The Attorney General's position is not the same as that of a minister, but he clearly has responsibility for the operation of his office in the same way as a minister has under the Ministers and Secretaries Act. We must distinguish between responsibility and culpability. As ministers pointed out yesterday, if, for example, there were a teacher accused of molesting a child in a school under the control of the Department of Education, the minister would be responsible. But he or she would not be culpable unless, having been informed of that fact, they failed to take corrective action. Similarly, for example, if patients are abused or left untreated in a public hospital, the Minister for Health is responsible. But again, he or she is not to blame, provided they act when the problem is brought to their attention. Another example would be a case of negligence by a local authority official. The Minister for the Environment would be responsible, but he would not be to blame. The reality, as we all know, is that hundreds of decisions are made in government departments every single day of the week. The ministerial head of the office is responsible and accountable for each of these decisions and must take corrective action when it is required. There are also in general responsible, as far as possible, for the efficient operation of their offices. That ideal is not always easy to fulfil, but it must be striven for at all times. Government in Ireland operates under the doctrine of collective responsibility. The Attorney General is the legal advisor to the government. The Taoiseach is in practice administratively account accountable for the Attorney General's office in this House. Indeed, accountability is unaffected by the Attorney's appointment to the Presidency of the High Court. 
I am here to answer for his office and his conduct of it in this House. If there were legislative delays, as there have been in the past, I do not think the House would find it an adequate excuse if I were simply to attribute all responsibility for the delay to the Attorney General's office. The responsibility would clearly lie also with the government as a whole. W. T. Cosgrove, as President of the Executive Council in 1924, stated, Given the necessity to have somebody to answer for the Attorney General in the House, where he was not a member, that, and I quote, in this arrangement, the Executive Council has the general responsibility and must be prepared to answer for the Attorney General, unquote. The reference here is Dahl Debates, Volume 5, Columns 916 and 917. In other words, it was laid down by the first leader of a post-independence Irish government at the time of the Ministers and Secretaries Act that the government as a whole was responsible for the Attorney General. In my opinion, it follows that I personally and the government as a whole must take some responsibility for the deficiencies in the operation of extradition procedures in the AG's office as brought to light in the Smith case. I now want to address all the issues surrounding the appointment of the former Attorney General to the Presidency of the High Court. In recent months, particularly since controversy arose about the appointment, when it was brought into the public domain, I have been faced with two unenviable choices. I was faced on the one hand by the opposition of my colleagues in a partnership government to this particular judicial appointment which was made much more difficult to resolve by the fact that it had become public. On the other hand, if I had acquiesced in the violation of a well-established precedent, it would have implied that the Attorney General did not enjoy the full trust and confidence of his colleagues, and consequently, his position as Attorney General would have become untenable. Part of the question that arose between us was over whether there was a precedent for the Attorney General to be entitled to nomination as President of the High Court. With regard to that point, about which there has been some dispute, I would like to quote one of the most eminent authorities on constitutional government in Ireland, Professor Basil Chubb, in the third 1992 edition of his book, namely The Government and Politics of Ireland, the reference pages 295. There he states that, and I quote, by custom, the Attorney General, a political appointee, who is the government's legal advisor and state prosecutor, is always offered any vacancy to the High Court that occurs during his, terms of office, during his term of office, unquote. I underline the word any, which clearly includes the presidency. No provision was made in the Programme for Government for any alteration of this custom and precedent which had grown up. I now accept that the desirability of such a custom is open to question. And both parties in government have agreed that it will no longer obtain in the future. Following the initial controversy, we reached an impasse on this issue. The Cabinet agreed to set up a subcommittee of four to see what way this impasse could be resolved. Discussions took place and some progress was reported. I then had the much publicised discussions with the Thornishte in Baldonnell on October the 9th. Following that meeting, the subcommittee worked out a new system of judicial appointments, which it was agreed would be incorporated in the Courts and Court Officers Bill on my clear understanding that this would pave the way for the appointment of the Attorney General to the Presidency of the High Court. Indeed, on the 11th of October, a government statement said, and I quote, when the legislative changes are approved by government, an appointment to the Presidency of the High Court will be made, unquote. 
I agree to repeated postponements of the decision at the request of the Thornishta. The emergence of the Smith case did not affect the integrity of the Attorney General nor his suitability for high judicial office. It was my understanding that the appointment was to be made last week. It was agreed to take it last Thursday evening, but in the event the government meeting was devoted to a discussion in Northern Ireland arising from the tragedy in Newry that morning. It was decided to have the usual government meeting on the following morning, Friday, and the full agenda was dealt with. The Tarnish they came to see me on Thursday evening and handed me a letter uh, timed 7.30 p.m. I responded to the letter in writing. I received a further letter that night from the Tarnish that timed 11.30 p.m., which was not received by me until I returned home from an engagement about 1.20 a.m. I rang the Tarnish day early the following morning. In these exchanges, I was anxious to accommodate the Tarnish day in every possible respect and had no problem with these other requests seeking proper accountability. The only outstanding issue was whether the decision on the presidency of the High Court required to be deferred in order to allow me to be accountable on the Attorney General's behalf to the Dáil in the Smith case. I sought advice on the proper procedures and was confirmed in my view that this postponement was unnecessary because accountability arises for all decisions that have been taken, but not for decisions which have yet to be made. The responsibility of the executive is to take decisions and be accountable for them afterwards to the Dáil. We cannot as a rule hope to satisfy the Dáil, and particularly the opposition parties, before we take decisions. When the former Taoiseach came to explain and answer questions in the Dáil on the Father Ryan extradition case, it was to defend the decision that had already been taken by the Attorney General independently. My view of good government is that it must be decisive. We had a long cabinet discussion last Friday on this issue. I was given...